All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so I guess we will start the session um, back again. We're, we will be looking at appendage closure cases and some ultimate cases. And um, I'm uh, excited to have Carlos as my co-moderator and a great set of panelists with uh, um, Moody Makar, Vivian Ng, and Jason Rogers, and Mohamed Sarik, who will um, join us in the, uh, as panelists. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gegen Singh for the keynote lecture on intracardiac imaging for appendage closure. Does anybody have the clicker? Keynote lecture by a keynote speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Um, so I was told I have to look here, but if I point, I got to turn around. So I'll try to do my best here. So uh, my name is Gegen Singh. I'm here to talk. Uh, the, the talk assigned to me is talk about intracardiac imaging for, for left atrial appendage closure. So why are we even talking about intracardiac imaging? Why are we even talking about left atrial appendage closure? I think if you're in this room, you already know the secret that, that the number of cases, the procedural volumes for left atrial appendage closure is increasing exponentially. Uh, these are just some projected uh, numbers, and, and I think every manufacturer has their own projections. But you can see that there is this linear increase that's occurring over the next decade or so. But especially as data from Champion and Catalyst get released, um, there's not going to be just a linear increase. It's going to be a little logarithmic as well. Um, so several, several institutions, several places are getting ready for this growth, a, a projected growth of about 18%. And, and so the question is, that's going to create a bottleneck. There's, so many, there's only so many people available to do these procedures. You need a proceduralist. You need an imager. You need an anesthesiologist. You need staffing. And so what we currently do in the vast majority of cath labs and, and, and electrophysiology labs is that it's a T, maybe a TE-guided procedure, and you need all these resources. And I stole some of these slides uh, from some other presentations, but the hope is, is that with additional uh, adjunctive imaging, such as intracardiac echo, uh, and can you start moving over to less resource-intensive uh, system to help uh, complete some of these procedures? Um, so, so there's been a lot of work done with the use of intracardiac echo, and, and two-dimensional intracardiac echo works really well. You can bring that catheter into the left atrium, as shown in, the, as shown in this panel here with a, a group of patients treated by the group by Al Cooley. And what you can see is that at least you can get on the, the bottom left image, you can see the catheter as it sits in the left atrial appendage. The middle panel, you can see the, this original Watchman 2.5 device deployed, and you can get a single uh, assessment of the, of the Watchman device where you see the circumflex artery and the Coumadin ridge, and on the image on the right, you can see the anterior and the posterior placement of the device. Now, when you do this comparison with intracardiac echo and TEE, now again, this is 2D ice, not 3D ice, there's no significant difference in the outcomes that we really care about. What do we care about? You care about could you actually do the procedure and could the patient actually ultimately come off of anticoagulation? So if you look at the rates of DRT, if you look at the rates of peri-device leak, especially these minor leaks less than 5%, and, and again, this is the watch, in a lot of these cases were the Watchman 2.5, the rates of the leaks are, are relatively low. Um, and then, of course, are you creating harm by using uh, intracardiac echo-guided left atrial appendage closure? So are you having pericardial effusion? Are you having device embolizations? And the answer is no. So kind of in that excitement, in the excitement of two-dimensional intracardiac echo, there have been at least three different manufacturers that are now working or have developed and, and now commercially available three-dimensional intracardiac echoes. And, and whether you call it 3D, 4D, I think that's somewhat marketing. Uh, but regardless, these are volume intracardiac echo catheters. They're, what they're able to do is they're able to take two-dimensional images. And so now this is the same patient, uh, and I'll kind of talk about why a same patient would have both TE and 3D ice in the same setting. So this is a patient who has a transesophageal echo, 3D ice to compare the images side by side. And the way the three-dimensional intracardiac echo catheters work is that you take a series of two-dimensional pictures, from there you create a volume, and that volume then allows you to do multiplanar reconstruction. So what you can see on the image on the right is that rather than physically going in and manipulating your ice catheter, there's, there's some of us, electrophysiologists predominantly, are fantastic at doing that, but a lot of the interventional cardiologists, once we get into the left atrium, you know, there is a little bit of a pucker factor of moving this ice catheter around uh, too much. And so, but what the, the, the benefit of these, these volume ice, or 3D, 4D ice catheters, is that you can just bring it in and you can do console manipulation with multiplanar reconstruction uh, to give you the rest of the data and rest of the information. So here's a case of, of where we have gravitated towards, and I think a lot of folks that are doing this already, um, and, and you, you could technically do this with two-dimensional ice as well, and there's a lot of people that do that. The three-dimensional ice catheters are a little bit more expensive, uh, but you can bring these patients into your, your standard cath labs with nurse-led sedation, uh, fentanyl, Versed, 
you can do your 3D ICE uh, uh, or 2D ICE LAOs with same-day discharge. But all of it, in my personal opinion, needs to start with some pre-procedure imaging. Um, and I don't know if broadly we can expand to everybody just coming in and just letting the intracardiac echo decide the imaging on the table. You need pre-procedure imaging, whether it's a CT scan or whether it's a transesophageal echo. The, the pre-procedure CT scan is pretty powerful. It can give you a lot of information, and we certainly won't have time to go into all of the information it, it can give you. We've been, there have been other sessions throughout this meeting, but one of them is simply what your appendogram is gonna look like. So this is the standard REO 25, caudal 25, and you can actually see the entire contour of the left atrial appendage. You can see what its overall axis is, how many lobes am I gonna have, and what else do I have to contend with any sort of other uh, hurdles. Unlike the transesophageal echo where you go 0, 45, 90, 135, the goal for intracardiac echo guided left atrial appendage closure is to at least find some anatomic landmarks and based on that make your assessment. So you want to try to get the appendage with the aortic valve in view, the aortic view. You want to try to get the appendage with the mitral in view, the mitral view, or ultimately the pulmonary artery which gives you your, your higher angle view. You can make assessments of your 3D or your, your CT scan in terms of what sort of, what sort of device you might potentially use. And then those smaller images on the right-hand side of the screen, what they show you is that aortic view, the measurements in the aortic view, mitral view, and ultimately the bottom, the PA view, it's that higher angle view, like that 135 view that you're used to in transesophageal echo. So these are critical in making the assessment of the device after it's deployed. So again, patients come into the procedure room. The, the start of the procedure is faster. You're not waiting for the anesthesiologist to intubate the patient. You're not waiting for um, uh, the nurses. The patients just come in. They get a little sedation. They start getting prepped and, and draped. We generally have uh, stack the axis on the right side. There's other centers that stack the axis. Uh, one, is, uh, one side is the, the, the LAO sheath, and the, on the other side is the, uh, is the sheath for the ice. We give therapeutic heparin right from the beginning. Transeptal puncture, as you can see here, is performed um, uh, with 3D ice guidance. And, and what's nice about with these 3D ice catheters is you don't get just one image. You can actually get X-plane. So here, for example, you can see the bicable view, and then you can see the short axis view. And it would be nice if everything was labeled in life, but it's not. But you can actually see where the SVC, IVC, and the aortic valve and the, and the posterior wall of the left atrium are. Now, this is the part that creates the most amount of stress. Okay, this is the part that I think most of us uh, as interventional cardiologists kind of pause, is to try to get the ice catheter into the left atrium. And, and I'll show you some data from our center in terms of how long it actually takes. Five minutes in the interventional cardiology or the electrophysiology world might as well be five hours. But in some cases, it can take up to five minutes. But, but there are techniques that are being developed to help assist getting these ice catheters across, but currently no dedicated system exists, and therefore this creates a lot of stress and angst amongst a lot of operators who are considering doing LAO closures with intracardiac echo. Once you are in the left atrium, then there are several views to look at the, le the left atrial appendage. You have your mid-left atrial view, uh, and then finally you have your, your mitral view where you can look up. One of the strongest things I encourage everybody is that when you first start adopting a, an ice-guided LAO-based uh, 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 um, uh, uh, process in your, in your cath labs, make sure you use Doppler to identify what you're looking at. There's the pulmonary vein, which is right next, the superior pulmonary vein, right next to the, the left atrial appendage. So you want to use Doppler, you want to use color to make sure that you're looking, truly looking at the left atrial appendage and not the pulmonary vein. Um, you can do dedicated two-dimensional um, uh, assessment of your left atrial appendage osteum. In addition to that, you can do multiplanar reconstruction as was previously showed. And again, all of this has been correlated with CT ahead of time. And again, remember that appendogram I showed you earlier, that CT scan gives you the contour. You already know what the appendogram is gonna look like before you even walk into the case. And this can then help guide where your transeptal puncture would be ultimately as well. And you can see there on the right panel, the ice catheter is looking up at the left atrial appendage and helping guide the procedure. So after the Watchman procedure gets completed, you can check your position with, with, uh, uh, with uh, dedicated views. You can check, assess for leaks, because that's ultimately the crux of the procedure. And then, of course, the compression and, and, and the anchoring and, and then ultimately have the procedure deployed. Um, all, we've gravitated towards CT imaging on a lot of our patients. And, and what you're looking for in your CT imaging, obviously, is to make sure that there's no uh, device thrombus, there's no peri-device leaks. And again, we'll kind of reconstruct those same views again, the aortic view, the mitral view, and the long axis view to make sure that you have complete closure uh, for these patients. So, this is a, uh, uh, from our series, uh, TIFAM, our current structural fellow, presented this at TVT this past year. Um, and, and the number's a little bit higher now in the, in the, in the publications in, in preparation. But if you look at the group of patients that, and how we have taken them through 
uh, our 3D ICE LAO protocol, what we did was we started off with our own self-adjudication. We had patients with G, GA, TE, and ICE. From there, we gravitated towards managed anesthesia care and ultimately brought the patients down into the cath lab. Now, in this large series, 52 patients so far, you know, the time to ICE to cross, again, I'm telling you, it feels like five hours, on average is about six minutes. Um, so, and that, and there is a trend where it decreases once you get past the first 25 cases. The need for adjunctive PTA to get the ICE catheter across was only four. Overall floor time is 20 minutes, but procedural times are about 63 minutes. This is less than what is coming out of the, the LAO and NCDR databases. Um, and then of course the big question is, is about, you know, are we leaving a greater number of leaks behind? Um, and, there, and, and again, most of our patients have CT on follow-up, and what you're seeing is it's not necessarily a discrete leak, but some of it may be just device porosity at the end. So no PDLs that are greater than five or DRT on follow-up. All patients were discontinued their anticoagulation and no major adverse events. So I'll close with this, which is, I think if you're gonna adopt intracardiac echo, whether it's 2D or three-dimensional, you, know, you have to perform a self-adjudication in your own system, uh, and that's, that's with concomitant GAN transesophageal echo. Pre-procedure imaging is very strongly advised. And the learning curve, I, I think it'll depend on how many cases you do and kind of what your comfort level is. There is a learning curve with the catheter manipulation, particularly as you're gonna cross the interatrial septum. Uh, and then ultimately you have to understand the console and the manipulation of that. Uh, and then there are several advantages and disadvantages, but the biggest advantages I think are that we are talking about more and more same day discharges. Now that we don't like our anesthesiologists, but there's only so many of them. So this kind of helps relieve some of the bottleneck. And then at some point you can think about developing super echo techs, and I think some institutions are already able to do that, where you can do an LAO rather than with an uh, invasive echocardiologist, you could just do it with, a, with an ultrasound sonographer. So thank you. That was terrific, Gagan. Great talk. Hey, we always, so you're, you're one of the very early adopters, and we all will always talk, hey, listen, every time we're doing uh, intracardiac echo now instead of TEE, we're getting rid of uh, anesthesia, maybe that imagery. What do you do with Idris? What do you tell, tell Idris uh, to do? Like, hey, listen, I'm not going to need you, or, or how are you incorporating him, the imager, into your practice? Yeah, that's a tough, it's like telling your wife you don't need her. Um, you know, but the reality is you always need your, your invasive imager. Yeah. Uh, so your invasive imager is somebody that, you know, you kind of grew up with, right? I mean, these are patients that struggled with you in tear cases. They're the ones that kind of, you know, shared the sweat, blood, and tears, and, uh, and everything in, in tear and, and other structural heart procedures. So I don't think it's entirely easy to let go of them, but it's by necessity that you have to do it sometimes. There's only so many of them, and they have their own obligations. Unfortunately, we don't, we as a society, and, and they're not rewarded as much for their job that they do in, in structural heart, to guide structural heart procedures. Uh, we know that they're under, under embarrassed, uh for their time and their commitment. Uh, but I think because of a resource issue at some point, um, for simple procedures like LAO, simple, I'm gonna put that in quotation marks, procedures like LAO, I think ultimately we, we may not need an echocardiologist. You could probably just use a sonographer who is very well trained on the manipulation of the console. For more complex structural heart procedures, for valve and valves, for, for tear, uh, for sure, you need an echocardiologist in the room. What we generally do now is for our LAO cases, um, we don't even keep them at the head of the bed where most of the radiation is. They now actually are at the foot of the bed, that's where the console is, and then the, and then the cable goes out to them, so we actually now protect them from the radiation. Yeah, I agree. We we do the same. I mean, for LAA, we probably, you know, they don't need and, and they have other duties to do. But yeah, for complex, more complex structures, definitely uh, having an imager is such an important thing. Even if they're not, you know, doing the TE itself, yeah. just the 3D ice interpretation is, is just so, 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 so important. Yeah. I think you, you brought a great, uh, great point and great talk, by the way. Um, is, is that learning curve, and I don't think it's gonna come overnight. Um, I think it's a great tool set to have uh, in your, if you're a structural um, uh, LA implanter, uh, and it's good to kind of step in that direction and get some uh, training on ICE ahead of time. And you know, that when we started a long time ago, I mean, as EPs, we go into the LA with ICE all the time, but we didn't do that long time ago. Um, so initially, that whole crossing into the LA was like, why would you do that? But then it becomes practice. But then getting those images, uh, I think it's a, a, a great way to learn that is if you're doing TE-guided 
implants is to deploy the device. If you've never done an ice in the LA, put the ice catheter through a through the delivery sheet and learn the learn the views. And once you learn the views, then you can practice going into the LA as a second step. So kind of staging that process and learning it one step at a time, uh, but making sure that you still do it right. I think that's very important. No, absolutely. I think the message from anybody who does this procedure enough is a, if you've never done Watchman or LAO, you don't want to start by doing conscious sedation, 3D ice, LAO, or 2D ice. I think you have to be a good left atrial appendage operator first, develop your skill set there, and then make the transition to intracardiac echo. So I totally agree with that. And just for the audience, the IFU was changed by Boston Scientific the FDA in terms of 3D eyes. You know, it wasn't in the IFU now, now it is. So it was announced at the HRS just recently. So, so one, one of the questions I have is, um, how reliable is the 3D ice for sizing of the left atrial appendage? Um, you mentioned that you need to get a CT scan. That's a very crucial part of the process for that. Um, in our institution, uh, we don't get a CT scan for the patient before they come. We rely totally on the TEE for the sizing, for the guidance, and for checking it. And many times we can even do it without contrast at all, zero contrast. So how do you think that it's going to be um, comparable or it's going to be, you know, the sizing-wise when you use the 3D ice? Yeah, uh, and, you know, you bring up a good point. The 3D ice is a tool. It's, it's not there to replace what TEE can offer you. So if you have a patient when, that you're worried, that has underlying renal dysfunction, right? If you have a patient that you think is gonna have complex anatomy, or it's a complex clinical scenario, they're, they have chronic AFib and they're not on anticoagulation. And, and that's a patient that probably still should have a GATE guided um, uh, uh, intracardio or LAO procedure. But currently, these 3D ice catheters have about a third the number of crystals that a transesophageal echo probe has. So you will never physically be able to have quality images, the same quality images that a transesophageal echo probe delivers. So that's just not gonna be there. But in its current iteration, if, if you do want to use it, you do need pre-procedure imaging ahead of time. If you're at a facility that doesn't do pre-procedure imaging, this may not be the right modality to start off with. Um, there are, there, in, in our series and in other series, they are looking at the correlation between the numbers that you're getting with CT and then the numbers that you're getting on the table. We generally, in our practice, and I don't know if for others who do ice guided, I, you know, as soon as I get transeptal, I have them start prepping the, 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 the LAO sheath and the device right away, because I've already made my decision based on the CT ahead of time. You know, I might do an appendogram, but it's seldomly the, the ice guided measurements that you're getting don't necessarily sway my decision there, so. I, I totally agree. I think with two devices on the shelf, I think it, it matters. It's good to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, I do think that you, you do get a little better assessment of the ostium and you can probably have a little bit better correlation on the measurements, depending on where you put your angles, especially with the two devices, the measurements are different, but you can't see past a certain level, like I mean, there's glass views and all that stuff, but still, after a certain level, you, don't, you can't really appreciate many of those features. Uh, so I, I truly believe that you should have CT pre-planning. Just generally, I think it's a, it's a good, good option, but if you can't, then a TE is probably the, the better option. All right, we're gonna move to the next speaker. Thank you, Gagan, that was terrific. Next speaker is um, Cliff. Is that, are you on the agenda next? Yeah. Okay, Cliff Kavinsky, he's gonna be presenting uh, LAA closure leak management. Well, I'm back. <clears throat> Thank you again. So uh, my topic is to talk about uh, management of uh, left atrial appendage device leaks. Uh, so this is a little more than a case presentation, uh, but uh, I will start with a case. Uh, so as you know, and has been talked about extensively, the effectiveness of uh, the Watchman device and uh, the amulet in uh, stroke prevention in patients with AFib who are not suitable for long-term anticoagulation. Um, there is, uh, as you know, variation in the size and shapes of left atrial appendages and, uh, you know, endo device, endovascular devices with fixed size and shapes often result in incomplete sealing. The clinical implication of these leaks, however, remains controversial. Uh, percutaneous closure of these leaks has been attempted in the hopes of avoiding long-term anticoagulation and minimizing the risk of stroke. Uh, the experience, however, is quite limited. Here's an example of a patient, 82-year-old, 
male with permanent atrial fibrillation, CHADS VAS score of five, uh, referred for management of residual leak following left atrial appendage occlusion. Due to recurrent GI bleeding on anticoagulation, he previously underwent a closure with a 31 millimeter Watchman device. On day 45 TEE, significant was leak noted in the uncovered anterior lobe, and therefore warfarin was continued. Here we see some of the uh, images. Uh, you see here a uh, gutter or opening next to the device, and you see it here on 2D and here on 3D. And uh, measurements, although I'm not showing you the actual measurements, measured around seven, seven millimeters. So uh, the repeat TE was then done at six months uh, and showed the persistent leak, uh, same size, seven millimeters, and therefore to minimize the risk of uh, uh, his r risk of long-term anticoagulation, it was decided to go in and proceed with uh, closure of the residual period device leak. However, we waited uh, six months after the original procedure uh, to give the time for the original device to be endothelialized and provide more stable anchoring. So the procedure went like this. After transeptal puncture, a French agilis steerable sheath was placed in, a uh, medium curve advanced into the left atrium. Then we put a 035 woolly wire into the defect, followed by a five French multipurpose catheter under fluoroscopic and TEE guidance. Uh, the woolly wire we then exchanged for an 018 uh, V18, after which we then tracked in an eight French 90 centimeter flexor. Uh, and delivered a 12 millimeter uh, Omplatz or vascular plug two, which is our preferred device for this uh, indication, particularly at this size. Uh, satisfactory position was confirmed, and the follow up TEE at 45 days showed no residual leak. Here's some the device is relevant. Uh, the 12 millimeter device has a long length of uh, nine millimeters, and actually will go through a six French guide. However, we used a larger one. Here's some of the images you see here. Uh, tracking in the uh, uh, vascular plug on the left, and you see the TE images on the right. You see us tracking in the vascular plug. Uh, TE images look very good. You can see it uh, very clearly. And then uh, here are some still images showing the uh, vascular plug in place. Uh, there was absolutely no residual leak. Uh, it looked really good. I was very pleased with this, uh, with this result. And you can see before and after stills, before on the top uh, left and top right, and then the afters on the bottom uh, with the 12 millimeter vascular plug on 2D and 3D uh, TEE. So uh, in terms of discussion, leaks remained a complication of left atrial appendage occlusion procedures. The clinical implications of these leaks are debated. There's really, we're in a data-free zone here. What is the implication of a leak? What is the implication of a five millimeter or greater leak? Uh, no one really knows. Uh, causes of these leaks are also debatable. Uh, and you know, the data shows that these leaks are not rare. Uh, they are seen both, both the watchman and the amulet device. Although I think that in the IDE, the amulet device uh, had fewer periprocedural leaks than the Watchman devices. And I think that's due to its uh, uh, dual sealing design. So in order to uh, obviate the need for long-term anticoagulation and to minimize the risk, uh, hypothetical risk of cardioembolic events with large peri device leaks, uh, percutaneous these leaks has now become more widely accepted. Uh, there is one large experience of uh, 12 patients uh, and uh, success rate is pretty good, 83%. Uh, so the, the important point is here uh, that uh, these leaks can be addressed percutaneously. The size of the leak depends on what approach you're gonna take. I think leaks that are large, greater than uh, 14, 15 millimeters, you should get a second uh, left atrial appendage occlusion device, whether it's an amulet or a watchman. I think that you need to wait uh, for a period of several months while the original device endothelializes to give better anchoring, to give greater safety to your procedure when you do finally come back and do it. And I recommend oversizing whatever device you use. If it's a vascular plug, 
We prefer the vascular plug two. We oversize to get good anchoring. Uh, so uh, closure of leaks is feasible, and I don't think we should be satisfied just leaving these leaks behind. Uh, although there's not a lot of data to drive us to do this, we have to remember the original purpose for which we did the procedure in the first place. Uh, and if there's still a large opening there, I think it's incumbent upon us to address that. With that, uh, thank you so much. Great case, Cliff. Um, so I think you, you showed a great point about, number one, not discontinuing the anticoagulation, and then number two, having a series of imaging to keep up with what's happening with the leak and then addressing it when it needs to. I think what we see is, you know, the leak gets seen, it's, it's called a small leak, and then they stop anticoagulation, and then you, you know, I know there's not as much data on long-term. No, there's not much data, but... but you know, if you believe in left atrial appendage occlusion in the first place, yep. then you have to believe that it's not good to leave a large opening behind. Yeah. And I think the key is that the 3D image, I think the leak which you measure is depending on what part of the crescent you're measuring it. So yeah. for uh, all you know, you might be measuring on the smallest segment. <laughs> I mean, this so was in the case that I presented, same way, if you're really in the, at the 90 degrees, essentially it's almost there is no leak, despite the fact that it's a large crescentic. Mm -hmm. But here it's very similar that it was really a posterior yeah. leak. I mean, your case that you showed in the last session, in this case, it's almost not even a leak. It's like an uncovered, you know, Append portion of the appendage. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's a, that's it's what a, I'm trying it's to say. Large, it's, it's, you know, many appendage left. And I, I think we would all agree that leaving something like that behind is, <clears throat> is, is not great. I mean, the issue comes with the smaller leaks, you know, less, yeah. less than five millimeters. Uh, and, you know, there was some registry data from the NCDR, with yes. the Sal Cooley paper, that even leaks less than five millimeters uh, could be significant. But, could be. But like a lot of things that we, you know, in, that we do, we know something's bad. We don't know that fixing it is actually makes it better. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, there is this uh, idea of leak management, though, that's, that's, that's seen, I hear people talking about this more, and even hear people talking about it at the time of a device deployment. Mm. Um, they're, you know, they will accept a small leak even, in, even at the time of deployment, knowing that they will go back later and, and plug it. Um, and I'm just curious, like, how many of you are are sort of employing that, I mean, because the options at that point are like, if you can't get something to sit, you would just like abort the procedure. You would remove the LA occluder and you would say, you know what, I couldn't close your appendage. Or you would then put something in and then tell the patient, okay, I'm, I'm gonna come back later and finish the job. I mean, how often are you we- You know, uh, I think that leaks under five millimeters, which is what's, what, the measure, what the issue was in the trials, five millimeters was kind of the cutoff for being significant versus insignificant, I think, for me, if it's a if, yeah, if it's if it's smaller than three, I'm going to leave it, and uh, if it's it's in the three to five, mm -hmm. I may give it some time to see if it closes over. Sometimes these things close over time. I'm not in a hurry to treat it right at the time of the index procedure. But I will also say that in the measurements, it's really very very simplistic in measuring uh, the leaks, um, and we can again go back to the TAVA procedure. If you have a paravalvular leak, it's not a two-dimensional, but it's a percentage of circumference that involves the, and we don't do that on a watchman because you can show like these that can have a large crescentic leak of a three millimeter thickness, and I don't think that it's the same thing as the same one that it's a three by three millimeter. I think to Jason's point, I guess you know if. There are, there are only two, two type of devices available, and you know the appendages come in so many different varieties. Now, ideally, we should not leave a, an appendage with a leak, but if you have a bilobed appendage and you do not have a current generation device, and depending on the clinical scenario, it's not unreasonable, I guess, if you do it as a staged approach, if you know you're gonna address it. The problem comes is when you don't address it, yeah. and you leave it behind with a the, with the large leak, and then ask, I guess there is always concern for the uh, for thrombus. Would you would you for those type of stage would would those have to be patients who are going to be on DOAC, like between the two, or would you ever bridge them with DAC? I I, I would always do DOAC yeah. uh, because I feel like you have taken an appendage that's already thrombogenic and made it more thrombogenic, yeah. and so I would leave them on a DOAC until it's completed. Yeah, we haven't taken the approach of this staged um, procedure, right? So we 
if it's less than three millimeters, we would potentially leave it, right? It kind of depends on what's the risk factors of the patient. Um, a three millimeter leak or less is probably still lower risk than having the full appendage open, right? Um, but it's also, as W was saying, we only have two devices available right now. So would we be able to close that open appendage, that open um, lobe that's still left behind, right? So you really have to think critically as to whether or not it's going to be feasible to make this better. Um, and as far as the, um, the stage of person anticoagulation, I wouldn't do that for somebody who's not able to tolerate anticoagulation for that three, six month period um, before you do the staged um, to close that leak. Uh, yeah, and then it's a matter of what device do you, you know, I've strictly been using the AVP2s for this. I haven't been using second watchmans or amulets. And, you know, as I'd like to see that case that you did that was very helpful to me. Maybe I'll have to think about that some more. Cliff, what do you tell patients then once you, you kept, you keep, you, in this case, you kept them on anticoagulation right. for six months. Right. Now you close it, it's successful. Do you yeah. transition immediately to DAPT or do you keep them on anticoagulation for 45 days? Again, it's a data free zone, so. Well, I mean, I think I do treat each patient a little bit differently depending on their risk factors and why I'm there in the first place. Some of these patients that I've treated, cannot be treated with uh, oral anticoagulation. Some of them I treat with DAPT, and some of them I leave on oral anticoagulation. I've done about, you know, six or seven of these. Other people's procedures, by the way. Uh, and uh, I've treated each one differently, sorry. You know, just to Muhammad's point before, uh, so Dr. Sarek mentioned, I mean, these holes are frequently not circular, right? They're commonly not circular at all. So just with that in mind, and this is just an open question because I, I have no idea, has there been any experience that you're familiar with just using, because you know, AVP2 is, has some limitations in terms of just the type of plug it is. But you know, for OUS where AVP3 is available, it just, just would seem like a more common sense type of uh, approach yeah. to this. Are you familiar you know, with I, that? I really like the AVP3. Yeah. Uh, in this country, it's only available as part of a registry. Right. Uh, but ultimately, I think it will be FDA approved, and I think it will have nice applicability here. Although I think the AVP2 adapts itself quite well to this, yeah. to this situation. It expands to the space that it's given. Sometimes, I guess, if there's a larger space behind, you could coil and then put the plug, and it just thrombosis much quicker. Sure, you could do that. Great Maybe we'll do that, and I'll show that next year. <laughs> All right. I guess thank you very much. That was a wonderful case. Uh, we'll move on to our next uh, case on leak management by Dr. Stephen Philby. Um, I thought maybe we'd do this a little bit more interactive this time. So we got a good panel here. And I know from the previous cases that you guys are pretty good, so I think you can get this. But I'm going to present to you two cases. Let's see how we do. Here are my disclosures. All right. First case, 80-year-old male with paroxysmal AFib, recurrent falls, including severe head trauma. So I think pretty appropriately referred for left atrial appendage closure. And, and underwent uh, this procedure at an outside hospital. Got a legacy device in 2019. And then pretty consistently had TE imaging, for whatever reason, kept getting TE imaging. And it consistently demonstrated a six millimeter uh, pair device leak and was told by the implanting physician at that hospital, nothing can be done. Right. And it comes to see me really as a second opinion, um, same, and here's a representative image, um, panel on the left without color, panel on the right with color, patient has a pair device leak, six millimeters. Motivated patient, wanting to come off of anticoagulation, is this an appropriate patient to close? So Dr. Nair, what do you think? 100%. 100%, right? Anybody not want to close this? Anybody think that nothing can be done? And okay, so what would your strategy be, Carlos? What do you think? What would your strategy for closure based on these TE images be? I like to use the same, the same as Cliff and AVP2. AVP2. Uh, I, yeah, I've done probably about a dozen of these as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah. See, we yeah. don't have a lot of experience closing leaks. That's yeah. we just don't have the leaks. We don't. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm, I mean, I really I had to dig for these cases, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do what you can, really. You, you, you're doing your best to try to close that thing based on your structural skills. But really, you don't know what you're doing when you're doing the first one, right? Yeah. You're just trying all sorts of catheters. So you would make a decision on a single view? This is that, uh, you'll make a decision on a single view? No, no, no. You would get a full analysis. Joking, this, is a, this is a typical. That's, that's a, that's a re very reasonable question. I mean, yeah. do we have enough use? Should this we is a order additional testing? Show us more This is a typical seat. location for leak. It's usually inferior or posterior in that yeah. because the appendix is oval shaped and that's the, that's the area of least apposition. Right. So, um, but it looks pretty straightforward, assuming yeah. it's a focal leak because it's kind of inferior and it, the trajectory should be exactly like you would do a, a watchman or anything. So it should AVP be. AVP2. Yeah, reasonable. Did you get a CT imaging though? Yeah, I think we did. So this is a re representative images from our CTA. We got CT. We get CT for everybody. We're 100% CT pre-planned, and we and we plan our leak closures with CT as well. Mm -hmm. And you really stole my thunder with this case because this is some very similar to the case that was presented earlier. Here you see, not only do you have a leak, and, and it measures about six millimeters, but it empties into this pocket, right? But it's also deep, isn't it? So this is a deep and somewhat tilted implant. So we got a combination of both. And that really, these images really changed our strategy. We went with thinking that this is going to be an AVP2, but when I saw the depth of that, I thought maybe this would be better served if we closed the, the, the origin of this appendage. So the plan was a TE-based approach, but we use ice for, for all of our cases, mainly because I'm comfortable with the transeptal, but also I think it really allows you to get an area in the inferior septum that, that you really can't access as well with TE. We chose a 22 amulet and a, a quote, quote unquote no touch technique. We really didn't have enough purchase in that pouch to sit our delivery system. So it ended up practically speaking, we just sort of fished around as you'll see and we got in there. And here's the, here's the, the appendageogram or whatever's left of this, this pouch here. And you can see that the, the pigtail catheter really doesn't have great purchase. It's sort of slipping in and out. If we go forward, we're uh, going to ball here, orienting the delivery system up, getting lobe in place, and then disc coming out then. Here's what it looks like on TE. That's just one view, but you guys pretty comfortable with that? Yeah, I'm not either. I mean, that thing, uh, look at the gap between the disc and the body of advisors. Oh, certainly no gap. It tells me it's, I don't know. What was the orifice? Oh, I don't, let's see. If I, 24, if I, if wasn't I go it? back. 20 something? Back. Yeah. yeah. It just looks like the disc doesn't really cover the whole thing, but mm -hmm. I mean, you picked a 20. I mean, the question is, would you be able to put a 22, which doesn't so, have as much, but... Yeah, again, it's already... This, you don't was, have a, a lot of this was a 22, yeah. yeah. This was a 22? Yeah, this was okay. a 22. Well, a 25 would be too uh, big. Anyway. 25, we felt, was maybe a little depth challenging, yeah. but yeah. This, this appendage closed. I'm trying to understand where the lobe is, the, because it, it, it looks like it's kind of in front of the face of the watchman mm -hmm. and not a, alongside it. I would think the lobe would be alongside the watchman. In, and then the disc would cover the face, or um, I guess I'm not quite understanding where the yeah. lobe is yeah. here. Well, so it's a 135. A of, yeah, he did have a good amount of appendage in front of the watchman to yeah. put the lobe, so. I did, I had 10 millimeters of depth. Okay, so that, that appendage closed. That was a successful close. So here's the second case, 74-year-old male with paroxysmal AFib or current falls, again with head trauma. Don't know why I have two patients with head trauma today, but I looked them up, they both had head trauma. And this patient had had closure with a 25 amulet, underwent a post-implant CT at four months, demonstrating a large leak. And here we have NPR images from that. So orient my crosshairs over the, the origin of that leak, and as you can see, it, it creates sort of an elliptical opening, going into a pretty large pocket there as well. Any thoughts about how to close this one? Here's some CT stills, and here are our measurements right here. So we have 
uh, semicircular defect. I can't see quite the min-max, but I can tell you the average diameter is 12.8. I can see that. So what, what sort of device should we use here? And how would we approach it? What do you guys think? They, uh, to me, it looks like you are going to need a second device. The question is which one's easier to get and tucked under the disc, um, because you have a disc and a lobe on the top. So um, you, could, you could try a 20 millimeter flex, or you could try a 16 millimeter amulet and do a double amulet. Yeah. There's not much depth that I can see here. So maybe another amulet will be a, a yeah. good option in this yeah. situation. The concern with this is the position. So here's our, here's our plan. Again, TE guided. But we, we thought we were going to need an Agilis catheter to really get underneath that. And concerned a little bit about the reach. We chose an AVP plug, uh, 16 millimeter, based on that average diameter. We're looking for something between 30 and 50% compression. Uh, we used a JR4, uh, a French guide catheter. And again, I was kind of did a dry run on this, sticking this through the medium agilis just to see how much length I could get with different guides, thinking that just to get from underneath, as it were, to do that, I was going to need as much guide as possible. And in selecting my access, I want to get a little bit high on the vein as well. I want to get every, every single centimeter that I can to my advantage. You can see that we're doing this with ice, but also with TEE. And I'm trying to get as low on the septum as possible. But even then so, you can see how you really have to scoop underneath to get this leaked closed. And here's the plug coming in on the right panel. It's already uh, deployed. You see that inner disc is sort of uh, stuck into or, or has grabbed onto some pectin tissue. And that actually had very, I mean, we really, I was a little worried about the appearance of that, didn't know how stable that was going to be. But, and I'm not a huge fan of, of big tug tests, but I did tug on this quite a bit to make sure it was very stable. Here's some 3D imaging on the left, of course, conventional grayscale on the right. A little bit of leak in between the two devices. And that was as good as we can get, as good as we could get after multiple deployments. About one millimeter is what I'm measuring. Are you guys comfortable with that? Yeah. You think that's going to close when we follow up in? This, this case was just done two weeks, three weeks ago. Probably. So I think that's going to close? Yeah. I yeah, think so, that's too. A great so it's result. in between yeah. two different devices. I think you're going to have an endothelial margin in between those two, those two devices. I think you're going to have a closed appendage. So key, key points from this discussion, really, is understanding the anatomy. And what do I think to do best? Well, multiple imaging modalities to do that. But specifically, some advantages that have been already spoken to of CT over TEE, understanding that not only is the appendage a complex structure, but oftentimes these leaks are very complex. And um, they can run into pockets and cavities. As seldom are they circular, as we've spoken to already. And then knowing your equipment. I mean, this is not something that we do very commonly. So doing a dry run and understanding you don't want to get in there and not be able to reach at the end. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, I, from what I've seen here many times and during the cases is that the main reason for the device not to cover everything is that they're very prominent. Uh, 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 ridges that entrap the base, the, the, the anchors of the device, preventing it from full expansion. Um, so have you ever thought about taking the device out and putting a different device inside it's in managing of these uh, leaks? Uh, yeah. There have been some reports about extracting Watchman devices and some successful, some not. Have I thought about it? Um, yeah, was it part of your thought, thinking process that <laughs> I want to take it out and then I put a different device? I, you know, because it, my, my whole goal in approaching these cases is to be as least injurious to the left atrial appendage as possible. This is an incredibly thin-walled structure that's essentially translucent ex vivo, right? Like you can see light through this, this tissue. So pulling on it makes me nervous. I don't do an extremely aggressive tug test. and. I think it would have to be a, a very unusual circumstance for me to consider taking this out. It would, I would be more concerned about a risk of embolization than I would a paradevice leak. I, I, I would echo the, the appendage, how thin it is. Yeah. And this procedure, would, you know, closing the, for those who have done it, 
it's a technically challenging procedure. It's not a procedure you, that you want to do in any type of uh, center. Just trying to get underneath uh, the, the, the previous device, making a, two double curves, then shoving a wire uh, into a little small gap, and then trying to get a catheter through a one centimeter piece of wire to then deploy an AVP2, where it's not an easy task. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm pretty sure I, I, I've had a, a fusions from 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 this type of, of of procedure in the past. So I just, you know, a word of caution for those uh, in the audience who are seeing this is this is not like uh, like doing a watchman. This is a technically difficult procedure. Yeah, it's, it's true. If you look at the meta analysis of all these uh, leak closures that have been published, there's a significant amount of fusion rates in those in those leak closures. So I think we have to. Like Cliff said before, we don't have enough data on this. When we leave, when we see something that's big, we, we feel like we need to close it, but I think it needs to be, it's a, almost a different tool, to technical skill set by itself. Um, coming back to your, your point about taking the device out, I don't think if there's a device that's sitting in deep, you know, within the appendage and it's a leak, I mean, you just never know how those anchors are engaged. There's all these collateral structures. There's the PA close by. There's a cert close by, so you, you kind of have to think about what are you going to pull on, not just the appendage. So but we, if we, a device yeah, is actually yeah. out, right, it's yeah. off axis, yeah. it's tilted itself out, and I would say more than half of the devices outside of the appendage, I think it's sometimes reasonable to take it out, and many cases have been done of pay, you know, taking it out. Yeah, our experience has been we had two cases like that, and one of them we spent three hours trying to take it out, pulling everything, and it didn't come out without effusion, and the other one was three hours, but luckily, after three hours, it came out. So it has been mixed, I don't know, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, and then you followed with another closure, you used and another then we, device? Yeah, we, we, uh, we, we followed with a different device. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, would be a, I would be a little bit worried about taking these devices out that have been in there for a long time, right? They're endothelialized, those anchors are now fibrosed in. Um, but also echoing what you have said, you know, this is a thin structure. These, you have to think about the fusion, but also we're putting in these plugs that are not, you know, developed with anchors in order to hold in place within the left atrial appendage, right? So also we have to think about the stability of these devices. So as you said, I would do, you know, very, um, not forceful tugs, but generous tugs, right, to ensure mm -hmm. that these plugs are stable um, within these large um, lobes that are left behind. Great job, that was a phenomenal two cases, Steve. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Konstantinos, is gonna be talking about uh, imaging save this LAA closure procedure. Excellent, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to the meeting organizers, Paul. Uh, great conference, great city, so, and a great facility. So uh, my name is Costa, I'm from Morristown Medical Center in New Jersey, here are my disclosures. Actually, one additional thing I will say is uh, I will talk about off-label use of a medical device. So this is a case presentation. 81-year-old man who was referred for uh, LAO procedure. Pertinent history is chronic atrial fibrillation, embolic strokes despite anticoagulation. This included DOAX. It included Coumadin. Um, and a known uh, chronic uh, left atrial appendage thrombus. Uh, heart failure with a mildly reduced EF, oops, uh, EF 45%, CAD and the history of GI bleed that was non, uh, lower GI bleed that was not life-threatening. So this is what the baseline TE looks like. So this is a composite of uh, TE views from the mid-esophageal window. And you could see just a nasty looking uh, left atrial appendage. There's some biplane, there's just some straight uh, 2D images, but really just uh, pretty significant, very echo dense, yeah, <laughs> it's clot. So very echo dense stuff, doesn't clear the appendage. You know, I think all of us would be afraid to cardiovert this patient, let alone put anything into this, uh, uh, put anything into this appendage. So, so this is a patient that, you know, we, oops, let's uh, go to the next slide. So this is a patient that we think needs, at least we would like to, you know, do something to the left atrial appendage, but how are we gonna do that? Um, there's a thrombus that's been there. I mean, it was obvious from that image. I have a TE maybe from a year or two prior to that. It didn't look quite as bad as that, but it was still, there was still something there. So this is a patient that's been living with this, but not living with it well, because they've had strokes, despite anticoagulation. So any thoughts from our esteemed colleagues about, you know, what do we do? Do we just let this be? Do we try to uh, 
you know, anticoagulate to a higher INR in a patient that's had some bleeding? Um, do we just, you know, go for it? Any, any, uh, any thoughts? I, I guess uh, my, my point is if there is a thrombus, yeah, if there right. is a thrombus, I always try to anticoagulate first if the patient can. Yeah. And if that means changing the anticoagulant regimen to a different agent or warfarin at a higher INR. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, these are patients who cannot take anticoagulants. So, um, some, and in those cases, you know, you come in with a pre-decided device and you know what you're going in for. You, you get one chance and you get it right. Yeah. And you get protection devices. Yeah, and we've done that too. I don't think we've ever done it with, you know, burden, you know, left atrial appendage burden that looks quite as bad as that. But, you know, typically when they're more kind of socked in, you know, pretty distal little clots, we, you know, we go minimalist. We don't, you know, put anything in the appendage. We just, except for the device. So, so we have done yeah, that, but I mean, this was intimidating to us. That was the sort of question is that even if you decided you wanted to do it, I wasn't sure there was even enough depth. It looked, the, the thrombus looked so proximal. There's almost no appendage left over. It looked very, very shallow. So, would there even be a feasible device, yeah. even if you wanted to do it? So I was asked to go back a slide. Uh, let me see, can I do that? Let me go back and go forward. So it's mushy stuff, right? I mean, it's, there's a meniscus there. You see echolucent stuff that's all the way at the tip of the appendage. You know, I would, you know, I call this, uh, you know, thrombus, you know, 99 out of 100 times. So it doesn't mean that you can't, um, you know, I think there is enough depth to Jason's, uh, to, to address Jason's question, you could see you could see the outline of actually you see that there's a tiny a little bit of fluid behind the appendage, so that helps you see where the you know where the margin is, and you can see the pectinase down there. So I think there is enough appendage uh, uh, depth. Yeah, I just don't think that there's enough depth if you want to do like a no touch technique in this yeah. case, right? Like, it's not the clot isn't distal enough for you yeah. to, to put it in. So so we went for it. So we've used the angiovax system many times on on the right side of the heart. We've never used that on the left side of the heart until, you know, until this case. So angiovac is an aspiration thrombectomy device. Um, it's, uh, it's an off-label use to use it on the left side. So we did transeptal. We also protected, you know, we tried to protect as much as possible. So we put two sentinels up from the left and the right radials for some, some neuroembolic coverage. So this is what, this is on the day of the procedure. So this is what it looked like, uh, still pretty nasty. Um, and you could see, I think you could probably appreciate a little bit better, you know, just that there's, you know, this is very, very sludgy. And then you see that echolucent area all the way down at the tip. There's a meniscus there. You know, this, you know, this to me is clot in various stages of formation. This is, I don't, I didn't put an image here of the, of the depth, but this is what the, uh, at least that we chose to use a watchman. Um, you know, after, after we suck out the badness. Um, this is uh, by 3D Echo. You know, the mean diameter was uh, 24 millimeters. And I didn't put an image of the depth, but it was adequate. Okay, so this is, um, so this is what it looked like. So we, uh, we did uh, transeptal. Uh, we uh, got across into the left atrium. We introduced the angiovac system into the left atrium using, uh, obviously, fluoroscopy, as you could see here, but also TE guidance uh, with, live, with live NPR to really just do the minimal amount of manipulation and really just position ourselves right over the left atrial appendage. Was this the old-fashioned uh, angiovac or the alpha it, it was the old-fashioned one because oh, we wanted like a, continuous. So you need a perfusionist and whatever. It's the whole, oh, yes, okay. it's the whole shebang. We wanted, at that point, the new one was out already, but we chose to use the, the older one, the legacy one, just because we wanted continuous suctions. We didn't want any intermittent, uh, you know, we don't want to miss anything. So yes, it's a much more laborious approach though, and I'm sure my IC colleagues could speak to that better than I can. Um, so this is what it looked like. So this is at the top, this is kind of sequential. So on the top left, you see the pre, this is uh, literally you know, seconds before we uh, kind of you know, turn the device on. So still pretty nasty. Uh, on the top right, you could see, um, you could get a sense from right here and then right there. We obviously, we didn't put this all the way into the appendage. We kind of hovered right over the ostium and then we turned it on. And this is, you know, within seconds, this is what the appendage looked like. So really it cleaned up. Um, I will say, you know, everyone's like, hey, what's in the canister? What's in the canister? Nothing was in the canister. We didn't see anything. So it was a sludge, it was a clot that had just kind of, you know, disrupted. 
I don't know, but nothing was in the canister. Hurry up to put the watchman. So away. exactly, good point. So fast forward, not even, so you know, we turn it on, it's like a vacuum cleaner, then we turn it off. So you know, five minutes later, <laughs> this is what it looks like. It's, it's I, you know, I'm gonna make myself feel better uh, psychologically to say that this doesn't have that little echo loosened stuff all the way at the bottom. So maybe that was kind of, you know, very early thrombus and we sucked some of that out. Who knows? But this is really, yeah, this was, uh, you know, unexpected. So, so you said 99 out of 100 times you call that a thrombus. This is that one person you will know. Yeah, I couldn't say 100. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, so we hurried up and we said at this point, this is as good as it's ever going to get. Right? And this happened just while they were prepping the, you know, the device, just in a couple of minutes. So we said, you know, let's, let, let's go for it. So we put in a 31, I mean, obviously a minimalist approach, um, no injections, you know, no nothing. And we just put in, uh, using uh, TE, live NPR, we were able to put in a uh, uh, 31 millimeter device, you know, good depth, good implant, et cetera. And this is what it looks like. And this is, and once the device was released, you know, it's immediate, right? Immediate, you know all the nastiness, all the sludgy, all the sludgy stuff that shows up underneath the device. Uh, no PDL, you know, well-positioned device. And this is what the 45-day TE looks like. So pretty good. Now this patient did not have an absolute, this patient had embolic strokes. They did not have, they had some GI bleed, but we felt comfortable doing low dose, or kind of a lower dose anticoagulation on this patient, and given how high risk the, uh, the milieu of the left atrium was. We've chosen to keep this patient on, on warfarin with really an INR kind of as close to two as possible. No higher and really not too much, not too much lower. This was done about a year ago and they've actually, he's done well uh, over the past year. So uh, in summary, these are some of the key learnings uh, for the operator and the team. I think uh, left atrial appendage occlusion is feasible even in the presence of thrombus, but this needs to be done you know, very carefully, it needs to have good planning. Uh, with, um, uh, with good imaging. Um, there's a central role for imaging, obviously, to plan and get guided the procedure. And then for me, at least, you know, the last point, oops, the last point there is, is a humbling one. You know, what's clot versus thrombus? Really, it's not always easy, uh, you know, to, to, to tell the two apart. So, and uh, that's what I'll have. Great case. You know, it always baffles me, how, you know, two things. One, how do you know this patient's not going to get a DRT, right? Like, you, and you, you got lucky with that one because always wonder this patient's so, pro, you know, prothrombotic, and, and that's definitely been one of the issues. Um, you definitely brought up a point. I mean, sometimes it's so hard to know if it's a thrombus or a or sludge, and, you know, on, on the piece, I will actually give isopril or will pace fast uh, to see if it clears. But that patient, obviously, I mean, there was no question about it. I wouldn't even try to do anything else. Yeah, and this patient had true embolic strokes, uh, you know, like more than one. So, you know, we felt, uh, you know, compelled to do, to try to do something. I, I would agree. I think we would have kept them on half-dose DOAC, too. And I guess we'll have to wait and see what Leo's four shows. I guess we, the trial's going to start enrolling pretty soon uh, with the concomitant LAC and uh, DOAC. That was one of the most amazing cases I've ever seen. That was amazing, Costa. Um, so peri procedure. I mean, <clears throat> you know, you're very worried about DRT. Was there any special consideration for restarting heparin like immediately post procedure? You know, normally we'd wait till the next morning to start the DOAC. Um, you know, did we start them on heparin like you know three hours after sheath pull or you know? Yeah, uh, no, I think I, you know, I don't, this was we did this about a year ago, so I don't remember ex the exact timing. But no, we started it pretty, you know, pretty quickly. You know, we're pretty afraid. I mean, and I didn't show the left, the just the other images, just of the left atrium. But you could see there's spontaneous shock. I mean, this is really poor left atrial activity, appendage activity. It's a smoky atrium, so we were pretty aggressive about, you know, trying to restart, um, uh, you know, systemic AC as quickly as possible with heparin. You know, and ultimately what we've done is uh, we've given uh, warfarin to this patient. He's fa he failed Eliquis, uh, at least in terms of, you know, having strokes. So, so we'll see. A year out and doing okay. Debbie, you did show a device this morning that was kind of like an angiovac designed for the appendage, you know, that it kind of suctions on the appendage and then like, like basically deflates it um, through aspiration. Um, I, I, I haven't actually seen it, but that could be a 
this could that could be this could be an application for that device. You could well, suck it out yeah. and then yeah. collapse it and then close it. You know. Yeah, I guess. I mean, the question is, I mean, you you are it's a suction, but it suctions the the appendage and um, it's a append device, uh, but well, applicator. So we'll have to see. I don't know. I'm not. You know, stroke is not a great thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is why it's off-label. Um, and, you know, and over the last year, I mean, this patient has said, great, I had this, you know, this thing that they talk about on commercials, right? Does, does that mean I could stop my Coumadin? And, you know, we're like, well, please stay on it, you know? You know, so it's, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a great answer for you. You should enroll those in Leos 4. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Great case. Um, so we'll move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, is uh, Dr. Leo Markov, who's going to show us a case of LAAC malposition management. Thank you. Um, I just want to orient myself with the... Uh, uh, okay, great, thanks. So I, I have another interesting case from Morristown, and uh, actually I want to thank Costa, who told me about this case when I was looking for a malposition case, because we also don't have any. Um, so... Um, let me just go, oops. Great talk. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we, part, uh, in addition to our clinical responsibilities, we, we do core lab work for many companies, including Abbott. Uh, so here's the case. Uh, uh, this is a 70-year-old man uh, with um, uh, pretty severe uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy who was on, uh, um, you know, um, uh, optimal therapy, was resynchronized. Uh, had multiple ablations for a fib, which included also uh, isolation of the appendage, but despite that, had recurrent atrial fibrillation, had, uh, has been on anticoagulation, but then developed um, a GI bleed, which was not too bad, but the decision was made to refer him for a, uh, for a percutaneous closure of, of the appendage. So um, in the initial screening, the old CT was used from, uh, uh, from uh, one of the more recent uh, ablations for kind of general um, assessment. This was a 64 slice CT, so it's just like one phase. But you can see that the appendage was a, a shallow chicken wing um, with a, a somewhat posterior um, uh, trajectory of the orifice. Um, the, we updated you know, the uh, sizing by TE um, uh, uh, prior to procedure. And you can see, again, shallow chicken wing, very elliptical orifice, very, you know, very wide in the 135 um, uh, uh, view there on the top, top left. Um, and it, you, in that same view, you can see that the pectinates kind of stare up all the way up to the, um, almost to the brim of the orifice uh, uh, on the posterior side. Uh, we do these things too, but uh, you know, uh, I think uh, four views are certainly not enough uh, to to uh, for complex anatomies. Uh, but in this view, I think you can see again the elliptical orifice and high pectinates. So the first attempt was done with the legacy Watchman device. Um, it was difficult to reach uh, into the appendage, and the sheath kept uh, kept flipping um, uh, uh, because of the stored torque. So. Um, we repunctured um, the second transept that was a little more anteriorly. It was a little better, but it was still unable to, to kind of get the enough stability, so the procedure was aborted. So the flux was uh, on the horizon, and uh, the hope was that, you know, with the flux, we'll achieve a uh, uh, better outcome. But it was still kind of uh, difficult to reach that sort of posterior appendage. Uh, the sheath this time was kinking. Uh, uh, it kinked the first time when the pig, uh, pigtail was removed. Again, the second uh, transeptal puncture was performed. We switched to a double, um, a double curved shift, and that kind of uh, improved things. But the but the device, the 27 millimeter Watchman, failed uh, the tug test miserably. Uh, so at that point, was you know maybe we're slightly undersized. Maybe we're just not having enough to to uh, to. F um, fill that um, uh, um, wide dimension in the 135 view. And then, you know, at this point when the device was recaptured, the sheath uh, kinked again. This time it was captured uh, on echo. You can see there was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of tortuosity. 
Uh, and then, of course, the mobile identity started to show up. Uh, you know, this is almost certainly endothelial stripes kind of excavated, um, but uh, there was enough worry in the room that these could be thrombi, and so uh, this procedure was aborted as well. Um, at that point, you know, amulet was not available, and it was only uh, in selected centers. So we referred the patient to a to a, a, a local uh, major metropolitan academic center for amulet. And um, unfortunately, all I have are reports uh, from there. Um, the procedure we we got the report that the procedure was done. Everything went great. It was done under eyes guidance only. Um, minimalist sort of approach. Uh, 18 millimeter amplatzer amulet was used. I thought it was kind of small. Um, and there was no evidence of device leak. Follow up TE it was done a couple of months after at the same center. Uh, the report showed stable device and said no evidence for flow or communication seen between left atrial appendage and left atrium. Perfect. So that's it. Uh, well, maybe not. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> patient came back in heart failure because he went back into a fib and had to be cardioverted and so cost the TE and what's wrong with this picture so I think we've seen some of these today already so there's almost like a, a new appendage uh, by analogy with new LVOT there posteriorly so the posterior lobe is completely uncovered uh, it's not a lobe it's posterior portion of the appendage is uncovered all those high pectinates that we were worried about are uh, are there exposed, but the but the device looks stable. Um, this is what it looks like if you look from the interracial septum. The whole lobe is uncovered, and you can see those pectinates. Uh, the defect was large, 17 by 9 millimeters. Again, like a, almost like an appendage size. Um, and if you look at the top right, that's what I wanted to point out. I think people mentioned, but at 45 degree, which that view represents, the appendage looks great. I mean, the device is, is, looks completely normal, and no uncovered portions. So another question, you know, it's kind of puzzling. How does, how, what's the anchoring mechanism here? Because the lobe, you know, maybe it fits pretty snugly. They're distally, but I'm not sure because if you look at the baseline pictures, that that may not be wide enough for that lobe. So I think that it seems like the mo most of the anchoring comes from this kind of bite-like um, compression. But a half center is half center for a half size device. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's half up, yeah. So it's only, it's, it's basically compre it's just compressing the uh, the anterior ridge. Um, between the lobe and the and the disc, but it's sensible. yeah, it looks stable. But it's just not big enough. Yeah, so I think these are my my main three points here. So there, we we need to acknowledge imaging limitations of of uh, of the um, uh, modalities that we use. So everybody knows that we need multiple views, but the four views, the the four classic Watchman views, are not enough. We, uh, and I think we've learned with Taber. You know, as far as sizing, as far as PVO assessments, the 3D is, is essential, whatever the 3D modality you use, be it CT or TE, but the 3D is essential. Uh, ice may not be enough in some cases where, where the anatomy is challenging or where it's difficult to reach, as, as, as I think is obvious here in this case. And then the large leaks, I mean, the question is how was it missed on TE then? I mean, the, the large le the leaks, are missed uh, routinely because the flow is laminar. If you if you don't lower the Doppler Nyquist limit when you assess for for um, uh, residual leaks, I mean you may miss uh, 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 larger uh, larger uh, larger leaks because our eyes are trained to identify mosaic kind of turbulent um, turbulent flow. And then of course if you look at the Intermediate views like 90 and 145, that appendage, will, that device will look uh, uh, well seated. Um, so the patient went back um, uh, to the major academic center and um, uh, had a redo procedure with less than almost four hours or, or slightly more. It was done under 3D eyes this time. 
And this is what was tried uh, according to the report. They tried 10 millimeter VSD device, was too small. 12 millimeter ASD device, couldn't seal the leak and failed even a gentle tug. Uh, a 16 millimeter amulet additional uh, uh, could not be placed because there was not enough depth. And so um, the, uh, the hope was for, uh, for a new deflectable sheath, which came out early this year. Um, um, uh, to be used next. So that's where I kind of leave this case. It's open-ended. We, we don't know what to do next. So part of it is presentation, part of it is a concept. Refer the patient. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll be, uh, you know, I, I'll be really interested to hear um, some of it I already heard from previous presentations, but what, what would you do in this case? Thank you very much. Yes, it is the toughest part of the appendage that's not closed either. It's that inferior part. Yeah. So I guess uh, you could wait till true steer is out. Um, you got a steerable sheath. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll fit, but it also comes down to whether you have a size of a device that's going to fit. And um, you might have to do surgical. Uh, op that might be might be the option. Yeah, I mean, the, pro the challenge here is the approach angle is, is so uh, acute that no, no direct cannulation, you know, kind of coaxial is going to be sufficient. You have to really, so, um, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that there's any sheath out there currently that, that will make that shape. It would have to be some nested system. Maybe, maybe you put in like a, a mitre clip guide and then through that, but then there's no sheath long enough to go through a mitre clip guide. So I, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a it's an approach angle problem mostly here. You could go IJ, but you still have to have a device that fits in there. So the IJ will sit in there well, but because it's low, yeah. but you still need a device. Surgery. Yeah. I guess this is a great case to say why you know if you're doing ice catheter implant, if you just keep the ice catheter in the mid-atrial view, it looks like a perf it's going to look like a perfect implant. Yeah. And with, especially with the amulet, once a disc is out, it's so um, hyperechoic that you, you can't really see sometimes, and color can be really hard. So unless you actually get into that transmitral plane and look all the way around, um, you can easily miss the stuff. I think it just highlights the, the need. If you're going to use ice, you have to do you know good ice. You have to do MPR. You have to do 3D ice, right? Yeah. 2D ice alone, I don't think is. I know there's you know some experience with it, but I. I yeah. I don't think we're, uh, yeah. you know, doing the patient. I think we're doing a patient a service. But I, I think in this surprising in this case, there was a T measurements, which are much larger. I mean, it, that they would not use those measurements, and went for highly undersized device. I mean, that's not that they did only ice and nothing else, because there is the data from prior studies that it's a uh, much more reasonable measurements. Well, I'm also surprised that they only used the ice when they went in to try and reclose that appendage, just given the complex structure and how shallow. You've basically made the appendage even more difficult to close now. They, um, I mean, to their credit, they down. did use 3D ice the, the second time. But I was also surprised. I mean, usually in a complicated case like this, that where imaging has already failed, you would throw in all your reliable uh, you know, modalities like TE. Because looking at the T, it looks like, you know, not only is it difficult to get into that area, but anchoring into that shallow area now is going to be very difficult. This might be a first case you take a device out. <laughs> we'll send the patient to theaters. So have you taken out an amulet? And, and how do you do it? How would you take this one out? Would you use a raptor or... Would I recommend taking it out? No. Have you have you done it? And what would you how only, would you do? Well, I've only taken one out that did that did not belong in the appendage, or was not in the appendage already, but uh, with the raptor. Uh, but I would I would not uh, I would not encourage taking that out because those anchors are pretty deep, and especially in a, even if it's a it's a smaller device, it's not compressed uh, at all. So th that's the only thing that's in your favor is it's not compressed. So maybe the anchors are not engaged, and it's just the Sandwich of it is just keeping it together, and you could slide it out more than pull it out. I don't know. So, oh uh, yeah, oh no, yeah. I mean, I wonder if a 20 millimeter watchman did they try a flex? 20 a flex would would actually 
work because you, you know you've like reduced the size of the ostium now and now you have like a you know the amulet is sort of creating a new kind of it's not such an you might be able to do it you have a new windsock but i would wait till true steer is out All right, last speaker, Vivian, is going to present my most difficult LAA case. All right, so hard to follow some of these cases here. These are my disclosures. So our um, patient was an 83-year-old woman, multiple comorbidities, um, had atrial fibrillation, um, but was not on anticoagulation because of recurrent hospitalizations um, and multiple cauterization um, procedures for her epistasis. Um, she had a CHADS VAS score of five and a HAS blood score of three, so she was referred to us for a left atrial appendage occlusion procedure. So here was her CT analysis. Um, as long as the patient doesn't have renal insufficiency, we do do CT analyses for all of our patients. And you can see what a shallow appendage this is um, with only a, a depth of about eight millimeters in one view. Um, and the diameter of the left atrial appendage was 22 millimeters um, if we were to do a Watchman. Um, so really here, we don't have the depth for a Watchman implantation. So we did further analyses to see whether or not we would be able to get an amulet device in here. Um, and 10 millimeters deep from um, the ostium of the appendage, we're getting diameters anywhere between 21 and 26 um, millimeters. So we thought that this would be appropriate um, for an amulet device here. Um, as far as our baseline TE images, you can see here um, this complex anatomy here. You've got these trabeculations on one side, and then you have this short um, chicken wing um, configuration here. Um, so our thought was to do an amulet device with a sandwich technique here. We did do FIOPS imaging or um, analysis of this uh, appendage. So what we see here is that the 22 millimeter device, if we were to place it proximally, um, we wouldn't have enough compression of the amulet device and we wouldn't um, get a good enough seal. Um, but if we were to place it distally, if we we're able to get it into this position, we should have enough compression um, as well as good enough seal um, with the disc device, or with the disc aspect of the amulet. So the clinical challenge here was a left atrial appendage with limited depth um, and with that chicken wing appearance. So we did our transeptal puncture in our usual fashion, um, and then we um, just tried to get as low um, and posterior as possible for this. Um, but then when we tried to cross the septum, we had difficulty getting our, uh, our delivery system across. You can see how much the um, septum is tenting here, and we're just not able to um, get the delivery sheet across despite multiple manipulations. Um, so the unexpected clinical challenge here was difficulty crossing the intraatrial septum. Um, so then we dilated the septum here with a 14 French sheath dilator, and we passed that several times through the interatrial septum. Um, and that was able to pass smoothly, although you do, um, sorry, let's go backwards one. Um, you do see here how much tenting is also um, occurring there at the septum. We tried again to get our delivery sheath across, and we weren't able to, so we ultimately had to do septostomy of this intraatrial septum um, with a six millimeter armada um, balloon. Then we were able to um, get our delivery sheath across, um, and you can see that we no longer have tenting of that intraatrial septum. Um, so as far as um, the resolution of that challenge, it required dilation of the septum with a sheath dilator as well as a peripheral balloon. Um, and we were considering potential repuncture of the septum if we couldn't get across, thinking that maybe we're just at potentially the thick portion um, of the intraatrial septum. But we were trying to avoid that just given the good trajectory that we had with that um, puncture. We then continued our procedure. You see here on the um, angio, again, how shallow that um, this appendage is um, and with this complex structure that's like a hammerhead here. So this was our initial attempt to do the um, amulet device. Um, and you can see that on the, um, on the TE imaging that this um, anchoring lobe wants to pop out um, and it just comes right back at, into the ostium of the left atrial appendage. 
So we um, had to recapture this several times and redirect it. Um, and this time what we're doing is, um, what we're trying to do is to get into this small little wing here, as opposed to going into the elbow of the um, left atrial appendage. So um, as opposed to going for more depth, we're redirecting um, more anteriorly in order to get into um, a potential sandwich position. And you can see here on our redeployment, we're able to sandwich now that um, small portion of the wing and then our disc is um, covering the osteum. Here on our final angio, you see um, that where you've closed the left atrial appendage. We did do our 3D um, T imaging to confirm that we've closed the entire appendage and we've got um, good closure here. So the key learning points from this case is just understanding each device's limitations and the careful pre-procedural analysis that has been um, you know, really emphasized in our prior discussions as well in order to try and anticipate any um, implantation concerns. And in this case, we did use um, 3D MPRT imaging in order to safely guide the manipulations here. This was one that we thought would be a more difficult left HL appendage occlusion, um, so we did not use ICE imaging for this. Um, and then also um, the unanticipated um, challenge of getting across the septum and having to use dilators and peripheral balloons in order to ultimately dilate that intraatrial septum. Thank you. I think that was a beautiful sandwich technique or modified sandwich technique. And I think that's one of the things that I think puts that device separate from the flex is you have the option of getting into some of those very acute chicken wings. Um, and doing a sandwich or a modified sandwich, but comes back to knowing that you have that appendage ahead of time. I think to me, CT pre-planning is the key, and you can clearly see on, on whether you use FIOPS or one of the other softwares. I think nicely executed, nice case. I think the, um, the balloon septostomy is, is interesting. I mean, we, we, you have to do it in some cases. Um, you know, for the ice-guided procedures, I, I see um, a lot of people just doing it routinely up front to make a bigger hole to allow room for both the ice. You know, makes so you do your transeptal, then you balloon it to, to get your ice catheter across. So you have a bigger hole to cross before you then put your your sheath in. But um, and I just think that's just fascinating to me because of the history of <clears throat> these transeptal devices. Ten years ago, we had all these articles about you know creating creating interatrial septal defects and how they may be deleterious and bad and they don't heal. Um, and, you know, we, we discovered most of them probably do heal. And um, now to the point where we're, you know, we're more freely dilating the septum, and, and I think most people don't worry about it so much. But I think probably it's not a good idea to dilate the septum unless you absolutely have to. That would be my, I mean, it's always better to have no hole than a hole there, right? So, um, but uh, how about you? Are you guys, do you, do you pr routinely pre-dilate when you're doing ice for LAO or? Not at all. Not, yeah. not, not in my practice. Um, we dilate with a watchman sheath or amulet sheath, and, and then we go a couple passes in and out. And, uh, you know, we may move it clockwise, counterclockwise if, if we need to, but, but no. I think sometimes getting that wire into the right superior vein gives you a more, um, it's a different path, and it actually, if it does not go well into the left superior where you have to actually, you're coming inferior posterior and anterior, and you're trying to go into the left superior, it's, it's a different curve. So the right superior is usually in a more straight angle. So that's one of the things that almost 90% of the time will work. Um, so we'll wait till that, you know, as an EP, I try that before I take a balloon out, because I have, you know, I have to figure out one of the texts to figure out how to use the cranking machine, is what I call it. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, it is. The <laughs> But, but the question, uh, Jason, is it better to have a controlled dilatation of the septum with a similar size than pushing too much and causing a septal tear? And, uh, and this is where, you know, it's like, you know, how much is, is a lot of push and how much would be like, when would you stop and convert to a septostomy? That's like, I think that's going to be the question. I think when you have that degree of septal yeah. sensing. You have that kind of tenting, I think it is the right thing to do. But if it's just not tenting, but just not crossing across, some of those tapered dilators, I think uh, the VLA, the large axis versus cross dilators are pretty helpful in those as well. 
But uh, yeah, usually it's often like an angle thing, right? Like how you've um, crossed in the transeptal versus now how you're trying to get your sheath across. Um, it's usually an angle issue. Whereas um, in this situation, you know, despite multiple manipulations and trying to redirect that sheath, um, it just was not crossing. Um, the dilator w for the 14 French sheath was able to go across, but it's just that transition on the delivery right. sheath that was not no, crossing. It happened, it, ha it happened in our center recently. I mean, I haven't seen it for many years. Uh, the only thing we did different is we used a four. Uh, balloon, not six, and it, it went, went well after that. All right, thank you. Great case. Well, thanks to all the panelists and all the speakers. Uh, we had a great session. Um, so I guess we'll close out the session for today. All right, thank you. Thank you.